What did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe an astronaut or a rock star? Well, another common occupation on that list is always a firefighter. There is something that seems so exciting to a child about facing danger daily. But like you'll see in today's episode, there is a gravity to this job that our childlike naivete doesn't capture. Let's dive in. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing you the story of a man who dedicated his own life to saving others, although he wasn't just saving them from fires. You'll see how this first responder pointed people back to the one who answers our deepest cry for help on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you'll want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The true story of Tommy Neiman. That's the building. The call said a fall at a condo. Probably some retired guy fell and couldn't get up. We'll find out. Well, there's a crowd in the parking lot. Must have fallen outside. Sheriff's here, too. Oh, no, I hope he's gonna... All right, all right, step aside. Let us help him. What happened, man? Uh, we've got to splint his legs before we can put him on a spine board. Uh, uh, What's your name, fella? Uh, Alan. Okay, how'd you fall, Alan? You're badly hurt, and you need to help me with some information, okay? Uh, uh, okay, we'll finish his legs, Tommy. You get the IV line set up. I'm on it. I think he jumped. One of the tenants said he saw him walk to the balcony, climb over the railing, and jump. Really? What floor? About the seventh. He's lucky to be alive. His legs are mangled. If he lives, he may never walk again. That's not all. We found a gun in his car and bullets. But the bullets don't match the gun. Officer, sounds like he's determined to end it all. We'll have to see what we can do to change that. Let's go. Alan. You can trust me, okay? I'm here to help you. Now, I realize you must be pretty discouraged. I can't even kill myself right. Uh, there's nothing worth living for. I think the Lord kept you from taking your life today. Why? If you think things are bad now, they can't compare to the misery of dying without him. You mean I would go to hell? Well, the Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I want out of this misery. Alan, maybe God put me in your path. I wasn't supposed to be working today, and it isn't even my response area. Can you give me something for the pain? They'll do that at the hospital after they stabilize you. How soon? We'll be there in five minutes. But I want you to know, Alan, that God loves you, and he spared your life. He meant for me to be on duty to take care of you today. That's the kind of fervency with which the man in our story serves as a full-time firefighter and paramedic. He has experienced life and death situations as few of us have. And this is the story of how he chose and fulfills that profession. It's the true testimony of Tommy Neiman, right now on Unshackled. I have a twin brother as well as a younger one, and we grew up in a middle-class family around Fort Pierce, Florida. Having given my life to Christ when I was nine years old, I stayed active in the church, but I dreamed of playing pro baseball. My twin brother and I loved the game so much, we even tried to rig lights so we could play at night. Our yard was fenced, and whenever a ball sailed across the fence into our neighbor's yard, we let it go. You guys quit early today. Yeah, Mom. Our ball went into old Mr. Tanner's yard. No way we're going over there, Mom. Yeah, I'll never forget the first time we climbed over the fence to get a ball. I think we were about five years old. Yeah, and he yelled from that dark porch, What are you doing? Get out of here! Oh, he's just a grouchy old man. Boogeyman, you mean? We jumped back into our yard lickety-split, remember, Robbie? Yeah, and we watched him shuffle out and get our baseball. 
He must have a dozen or more by now. Well, he won't get any more. We're moving soon. That grouchy old man we feared so much faded from memory as we struggled through our teenage years. In addition to my dreams of being a baseball player, I was also drawn to TV programs about emergency response, and I chased fire trucks as soon as I could drive. I played baseball in college until the second year when I dislocated my shoulder and sat in the stands for two months. You're still not playing? No, and I'm rethinking my plan of a baseball career, Robbie. Maybe it's not what God wants for my life. What then? Maybe I'll try to get into the local fire academy. <laughs> I'm not surprised. You were following the lights and sirens as soon as you could drive. It's exciting to watch fire and rescue teams. I love it. Watching is a whole lot different from going into a burning building, Tommy. Uh, it's dangerous work. Takes guts. Yeah. I get to hang around the emergency room at the hospital. As a security guard? Sure. That's exciting, too. So, you think this is where God wants you? Maybe. There's an opening at the medical examiner's office at the hospital. I think I'll apply and see if... God opens the door. The job was assisting in autopsies. After six weeks of training, I became the deaner, opening bodies for the pathologist to determine the cause of death. The work prepared me to get through paramedic school and helped me treat the mangled bodies I faced as a paramedic. Being a deaner also made me see that death is real, regardless of age or social position. Then I went through training at the fire academy and became a firefighter at age 23. One summer day, we responded to a call the dispatcher described as fall with a cut. When we got to the rundown house, party goers met us and pointed to a blood-soaked man lying in a cactus planter outside the front door. He had fallen backwards through a glass door, severing the arteries in his legs. Oh, man, look at all that. Oh, man, sliced through almost to the kneecaps. I've got the towels in place. Bend his legs to help stop the bleeding. Ah, uh, he's losing consciousness. Hey, buddy, stay with us. Stay awake, man. The sea collar's on. Let's log roll him onto the board. Ready? Set? Roll. Oh, man, look at his back, covered with... Cactus splinters. Yeah, and our gloves covered with blood. <sighs> Let's get him out of here. Tommy here. Tommy, how's it going? Ooh, we had a scare yesterday. Some guy was drunk and fell backwards through a glass front door right into a cactus planter. Ouch. Worse than ouch. It severed the arteries in his legs. Blood everywhere. Any one of those cactus splinters could have pierced our gloves. Understand. You were concerned about getting hepatitis or AIDS. Exactly. We managed to get him onto a rigid backboard and into the truck, but he'd lost so much blood he was losing consciousness. Ugh, I wouldn't like your job. We got him into a mast suit pronto. Did he live? Yeah. He'll need lots of reconstructive surgery, though. How about you guys? No puncture wounds? That was the first thing we checked. No holes in our gloves, no cactus slivers either. God really protected us. There were lighter moments when we joked and played basketball at the station, days of little activity. Duty consisted of 24 hours on and 48 hours off. I married a wonderful woman named Alicia and we had three children, a son and two daughters. Then came that call about a fall at a condo and our unit responded. We rushed the guy named Alan to the hospital and by the time I filed my report, he was on his way to surgery. The next day, I told my wife about him. The poor man! Did you see him again? He was heavily sedated, moving from one x-ray place to another. Oh, do you think he'll ever walk again? I asked the emergency room doctor that, and he said it was unlikely. Some of the shattered bones were driven right into his flesh. Mm, that's horrible. Desperate. He needs the Lord. I'm sure you talked to him about Christ. I told him I'd come back and visit. Said I'd be praying for him. I will too, Tommy. Several other firefighters and paramedics shared my love for the Lord, and we often prayed or studied the Bible together at the station. I told them about Alan, and one of them went with me to visit him. But he was in such pain, he told us to leave, so we did. I let a couple days pass before visiting again. 
and he was much more receptive. I'm sorry I was rude, Tommy, but not, I hurt so badly. I understand, Alan. Besides, God is not my favorite topic of discussion. He disappointed you? Well, my family's Jewish, so I've heard about God all my life. He's, he's too demanding, too strict. I can't live up to it. He's also a God who loves you. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. He created us to have a relationship with him. What kind of a father would have only a demanding relationship with his children? The God I know. You don't really know him, Alan. The Bible says, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. <sighs> My godmother's son left his... Jewish heritage to follow Jesus. He has a career in Christian music. Just recorded his first album. You know, Alan, all the disciples and most of the first century Christians were Jews who made that choice. Some choice I have now. I'm just a cripple with a wasted life. Not so. The Lord can change that. How? The prophet Isaiah said, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Jesus is that light. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You think I've been walking in darkness? That's the real reason you fell. Let Jesus Christ through his word light the way. He loves you so much, Alan. No matter what happens, he loves you. I continued to visit him because I knew he needed hope and a purpose in life. During that time, an elderly woman was assigned to sit in his room, and I would see her quietly praying as I shared nuggets of God's love, reinforced with examples from my own experience. But his despair had erected a wall of resistance. Folks, we'll get back to Tommy's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's Unshackled Podcast. Dot org and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled, we take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, let's get back to Tommy's story. Have you ever had to deliver a baby, Tommy? Several times. <laughs> Pretty exciting, huh? Oh yeah, new life always is. But it doesn't compare with the new life that comes when you receive Christ as Savior. I'm starting to believe you. Don't believe me, Alan. Believe God. Here, I brought my Bible. Let me read you this. Jesus was quoting the prophet Isaiah when he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Oh, that's me. Brokenhearted, captive, and bound. Satan has you bound and deceived, Alan. Listen, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. He said that? Yes. The Bible's full of great promises from God to man, and they are just waiting for you to do your part so that you can receive his promises. I have to admit, the things Jesus said are good to hear. Truth speaks to the soul. 
Here, read this. If the sun therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free of what? Whatever has you bound. Satan is a master of attacking our thoughts. God calls them fiery darts that we quench with faith before thoughts become action. I see what you mean. This Bible says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Tell me, how does he destroy the works of the devil? When you believe that he died for your sins and you repent and then ask him to save you, the devil has no more power over you. From then on, you have the Spirit of God dwelling inside, and he is your shield, your guide. Would you like to do that, Alan? Yeah, I would. Two weeks after he attempted suicide, Alan prayed to receive Christ as his Savior, and he was born again. Despair and depression vanished. He studied the Bible and discussed scripture with me. About 10 days later, he got out of bed and took several slow steps. A month passed and he was to be released. So I invited my wife to go with me to the hospital to get him. We waited outside. I'm so glad you invited me to come along, Tommy. This is a special day. You never complained about the time I spent with him, Alicia. It was vital. To think I got to take him to the hospital, and now I get to take him home to Miami. He can get more physical therapy there with his sister, but what about his new faith? The Lord will take care of that. He promised never to leave us or forsake us. Mm, it's time. Any minute now, the nurse should wheel him out. Yeah, there he is. And he's not in a wheelchair. Oh, not even crutches or a walker. Tommy, that's amazing. He's walking. Alan, you really are a new creature in Christ. We were friends and brothers in Christ, and I was the best man at his wedding a year later. Both my brothers went through seminary and became pastors of churches in Florida, and I was thrilled to sit with my family in the balcony of an old church in town while my younger brother preached his first sermon. One night that old church caught fire, and I drove the fire engine that responded. Smoke poured out of the sanctuary windows, followed by leaping flames. I positioned the truck between the church and a hamburger restaurant filled with people. And I stood at the engine's pump panel, controlling the gate valves, pumping water to our men who held the hoses. As they battled the blaze, I battled the enemy of our souls. The next day, I called my brother. Terry here. Hey, Terry, it's Tommy. Hey, what's up, Tommy? Well, we had a church fire last night where you preached your first sermon. Oh, no. Not that wonderful old church. Oh, was it destroyed? Yes, it was a total loss. A two-alarm fire that almost got the hamburger place beside it. Oh, how sad. That was a beautiful church building. But you know, Tommy, we are the real church of God. And nothing can destroy us. I had thoughts like that last night surprised you have time to think so deeply when you're fighting a fire. I was the engineer running the gate valves. It's a good ministry you have, Tommy. You could just share Jesus with people that won't go near a church and would never hear a sermon. Speaking of that, remember old Mr. Tanner? Uh, barely. Oh, uh, he was a neighbor at our old house when we were just kids. Right. Well, we were dispatched to that street one night when I was the paramedic on duty to that very house. You're kidding. I'm not. Is he still living there? It's been a long time. 17 years, and he was the patient. I walked in expecting to see a pile of baseballs in the corner. <laughs> so, uh, what happened? Well, he was dying of cancer, and we took him to the hospital. But before we left, I went to his bedside and shared Jesus with him. Oh, do you think he understood? Yes. I held his hand, and when I asked him if he understood, he squeezed my hand. Oh, that's wonderful, Tommy. To think that God used you to minister to that grouchy old man from our past. God can use anyone, anywhere, for his purposes. I have grown to hate seeing what drugs and alcohol do to people, and I've seen the effects repeatedly as a paramedic. Horrific accidents, needless tragedies, knifing, shootings, abuse too grim to relate. Once we transported a 16-year-old girl with seizures who tried crack cocaine. Another time we responded to a young man who called from a payphone. 
we found him behind an abandoned building. I need help, man. I can't go through what I did last night and this morning. Was it drugs? I tried cocaine for the first time. I've been on the street two weeks and always resisted. I was gonna go back home. But then last night I tried some. Big mistake, huh? Oh man, this morning a voice told me that I needed more of that stuff. Then I saw this lady walking with a purse. And the same voice told me to take her purse so I could get some more of that stuff. The voice kept yelling at me to go. Take it now! I freaked out! I can't live like this! Listen to me. The Lord <laughs> kept you from assaulting that woman. <laughs> The voice you heard was demonic. But it was so real. So loud in my ear. Listen, man. That drug opens you up to demonic spirits. I don't doubt that you actually heard it. But the power of God is greater than anything Satan can say or do. I'm so messed up, man. God won't come help me. Yes, he will. He loves you. <laughs> I think God arranged for me to be here today. I'll get you help at a health clinic if you agree to go. I'll go. The police are responding. They'll start the paperwork. Go with them. Yeah, okay, okay, make some room here. Come on. Okay, come on, buddy. We'll help you up. I'm yeah. praying for you, man. I got it. Come on. Thanks, man. When he finished treatment, he went home. I'm convinced that God intervenes in our lives to get us to face our sinful nature and see the remedy. Jesus Christ. He's the divine paramedic and firefighter who is always at hand, ready to rescue us from the fires of life and the eternal flames of hell. And believers are his body on earth serving his purposes. But there was one day I failed. How are things at the station? Okay. Well, you seem a little down, Tommy. That's not like you. We had a serious call today. Didn't start out that way. Just a man with back pain. Back pain? Yeah. When we got there, he seemed embarrassed that he called. Said it wasn't too bad, but we examined him anyway. Took his blood pressure. It was so low we could hardly find a pulse. Uh, well, what was wrong? An aortic aneurysm. I suspected it when I saw the swelling in his abdomen, so we rushed him to the hospital. Why did his back hurt? Because the aneurysm was pushing against his spine. Oh, he died? Yes. We made it to the hospital, but he died during surgery. Why are you so affected, Tommy? Because I knew the Lord wanted me to share Jesus. We were too busy on the ride to the emergency room trying to get his blood pressure up. Then when we got there, doctors and nurses were all over him. Then his family arrived. So you didn't have a chance? Yes, I did. The Lord gave me several opportunities when I could have gone to him, but I kept thinking of reasons not to. And then they took him to surgery. I know you prayed for him. Yes, but... The doc said he had only a 5% chance, even with surgery. How do you know he wasn't saved? I don't know, but the point is, I could have questioned him about a relationship with the Lord, and I didn't. Sometimes we have only one opportunity to share God's message of love and salvation before it's too late. That's why I'm sharing my experiences as a paramedic and firefighter, telling of God's amazing grace and his eternal gift of salvation. One day I experienced that grace in a special way. Our unit responded to a series of brush fires along the interstate. Winds carried hot embers, igniting more fires wherever they landed. We call them spot overs. Dark smoke filled the air as we struggled to save houses nearby. Riding in the back of a brush fire truck with a nozzle in hand, I shot the water wherever a blaze erupted. Over there! Uh, are you sure, Tommy? You got heavy fuel close by. I can handle it! The wind is moving away from the brush. Let's just give it a shot! Suddenly, the wind shifted and fierce fire engulfed the brush around us. I slammed against the back windshield in a fetal position as my lieutenant gunned the truck into a previously burned area and we were safe, praising God. If the truck had stalled, we'd have been toast. My wife saw the devastation on the news. That fire really spread. It was on the radio and TV all day. I think all the units up and down the coast were fighting those fires. I'm so glad you weren't hurt. It was close. 
We started out completely covered with turnout gear, but when I threw myself against the back window, my helmet and collar separated enough that it singed my ear and my hair. See? Oh, Tommy! Doesn't hurt. Top of my ear was numb for a while, but the Lord protected me. Oh, thank God. It was frightening, Alicia. I can still see the orange head of that fire. I always pray for you. Protective gear is vital, and so is spiritual gear. The armor of God? Yes. Nothing can harm us when we have on His armor. We speak of the last alarm, the dispatch from which a fireman doesn't return. And the same is true of us in this life. There will come a time when God sounds the last alarm, the last trumpet, and you will stand before him to be judged for your deeds in this life. My prayer is that you will choose salvation through Christ today so that you can meet God as your savior instead of your judge. It's a free gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listening friend, reach out and take that gift of salvation. Wouldn't you like to have your sins forgiven, to have fellowship with the Lord, to have eternal life and meaningful purpose now? All you have to do is ask God to save you in Jesus' name, mean it, and begin a new life of submission and sanctification. If you need help in making this crucial decision, we encourage you to call 1-888-NEED-HIM, or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312 312- Two eight one one two six four. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for this sweepstakes contest is yet another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This specific plaque has dark brown bark and a golden center. The scripture is written in light green color that makes it pop. If you'd like to take a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. Folks, unfortunately, we are only able to mail this plaque to locations within the United States, so our drawing is limited to U.S. addresses. But if you reside in the U.S., all you have to do to enter our sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. That's your name, phone number, and email. The winner of the sweepstake for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced March 20th, but the deadline for entry is March 4th. We look forward to hearing from you, and next time... Mother, the rabbi asked me to read from the sacred Torah aloud. Can you believe it? Searching for something meaningful in life made Shaul Katzoff an avid student of the Torah in his homeland of Israel. Just think of it. At my bar mitzvah, a rabbi will declare me to be a man, 
and I will be wise. You think that means you will then have the answers to all of life's questions? Maybe not all, but the most important ones. Shoal was sure that all the answers in the universe could be found in learning and keeping the laws he had studied so diligently as a boy. I've studied Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, and more rabbis than I can count, but I still haven't found the answers I need. Would he ever find an answer to the burning questions of his soul? I'm searching for answers. Could it be you've been looking in the wrong places? Find out soon in the true story of Shaul Katzoff on the next Unshackled. Heard in the true story of Tommy Neiman were Kurt Nabig, Allison Voller, Tom McElroy, Ed DiZallo, Steve Bayorgin, and Demetrius Troy. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Holly Krajewski. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Kenitha Gabler. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>